Okay, I'd like to introduce Richard Weston, who is the CEO of Healing Foundation, who will facilitate the next part of this session. Thanks, Richard. Thank you. Um, what a great bunch of dancers, uh, and particularly for me, I'm a descendant of the Merriam people of the Torres Strait. My mother was born on Murray Island, and my father is the son of Scottish immigrants from Edinburgh. So, great way to blow out the cobwebs. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this country, the Gimoy Yidinji people, on whose country this conference is being held this week. I pay my respects to their elders and their ancestors, past and present. Ladies and gentlemen, we enter the third and final day of another great snake conference, a great venue and a great program full of presentations about the inspiring work, the ideas and projects that are happening every day. The work that you all do for the health, safety and well-being of our children day in, day out across this wonderful ancient country of ours. The conference has been supported by a wonderful social program that has helped develop new friendships and networks and deepen those that already existed. Last night was no exception in the conference dinner. Today's morning plenary will be about a campaign. Will be about a campaign, that's just to wake you up, to address the over-representation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children in the child protection system. We'll be hearing from, uh, we'll have a panel of five people. Uh, it was four, went back to three, come back to five. So we're very fortunate to have um, Rachel Atkinson here today with us. Rachel will be talking about um, causes of uh, overrepresentation, the impacts of removal of children. Jackie Reed, who's CEO of Create, will talk about engaging youth and children as integral partners in any campaign. We also have with us Simon Schrappel, Schrappel, sorry Simon, um, who will be talking about engagement of non-Indigenous agencies in this program. And also joining, joining us today is Michael Tazard from uh, Peak Care in Queensland, who are involved in a similar campaign, Combined Voices, and he'll talk about some of the lessons that we like learn for a national campaign. So I'm going to invite the panel to come up and please take a place um, in, the, uh, in the chairs. The fifth panellist is uh, Sharon Williams, who you all know, and Sharon will talk um, more broadly about the campaign and strategies and specific actions that we might take. Following some presentations by each of these panellists, we'll be opening the floor up for discussion, questions and comments. And then we'll have Sharon uh, just, uh, just finish it off for us. Just give them a chance to get into position. Everyone having a gulp of water? Okay, I won't say anything about state of origin other than to say <laughs> there are two of our biggest states of Australia both totally in shock this morning. One because they've forgotten what it's like to win and the other one because they've forgotten what it's like to lose. But we'll move into this now. We might start with um, Rachel. Rachel Atkinson, please. Well, thank you for that. I have to say, um, I'm here to talk about the causes of why Aboriginal kids are overrepresented in the um, Department of Child Safety. I don't want to insult anyone's intelligence in this forum today. I think everyone knows why and what the causes are. But where we've got to go from there now is, well, we know the causes, how do we fix it? And I think just by the mass numbers that come to this conference in the last couple of days, that light is so bright on my eyes, I'll have to go down a bit is demonstrated that people are out there doing some fantastic work to look at better ways for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander kids in this country. There's also people out there fighting the cause that I, I could mention their names here today that have been there for 30, 40 years and something's not working and what is it? That's what we've all got to come together and start working about. So. 
I'm not going to go on about the poverty or, you know, but what I will emphasise is that us as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, let's take the lead. Let's stop it and say enough's enough. And I think through the good work that this campaign's coming together is going to actually, you know, draw this to the whole nation's attention. So I could talk on and on for days and days about the causes, but I think we're now in, in the point of my life and the rest of everyone else here today, and no doubt a lot of other people, is that we don't want to hear it anymore. We want to make some changes. And how are we going to do it? How do we take ownership of a problem? I mean, it's our community, it's our kids. We've got to own that problem. I think the other thing, we've got to set the agenda with this government, stop them, their legislation is too broad and it impacts the most vulnerable and that's our kids. So I don't want to go on about it because I just want to introduce and can sort of say let's all take a lead on a way forward and stop our kids coming into care. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Jackie Reed, we might ask you to come forward now. Jackie's going to talk about the importance of engaging children and young people in a campaign of this type. Hi, everyone. I'm the CEO of the CREATE Foundation. I guess our key aim is to represent the voices of kids in care, and that includes Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children. Children are central to this debate, front and centre and engaging children and young people in decisions that affect their lives and involve their family and their kin is absolutely essential and it makes sense, but we don't seem to get it right. What's happening now is not working and we can't continue to do the same things and expect a different result. It's one of those old sayings that everybody nods their head in agreement but we seem to be caught in a rut. Participation of children and young people is far more than just giving them an opportunity to have a say. It's actually listening to what they say. All too often governments, us included, are great at going out there and saying to kids, come on, tell us what your issues are, but we don't actually do anything about it. It's about being valued and it's about being involved and it's about giving them opportunities to have a say on terms that meet their needs. Our recent report card that we ran out in 2013 interviewed 1,069 children. Of these, 309 children were Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. This survey was aligned with the National Out-of-Home Care Standards and covered the seven life domains. Of the group of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children who were taken from the Aboriginal families, only 10% of those children had a cultural support plan. This is coming directly from the kids. Of this sample, 31% of the kids said that they felt some connection to their culture. 39% said that they felt somewhat connected. And 30% said that they had little or no connection with their culture. We also found out from the kids that they, the Aboriginal children knew less about why they were in care than did mainstream children. 25% of Aboriginal children in this survey said that they hadn't been told anything about their culture. That was across the board, across Australia. 23% of Aboriginal children had been to four or more primary schools compared to only 12% of the mainstream population. Interestingly, and the point I'm trying to make is, that there was no difference noted across the spectrum of these kids, both mainstream and Aboriginal, about their capacity to have a say. They all felt that they had opportunities to have a say. So my question is, why aren't we listening? The impact of children and young people not being involved and not having a say is profound. It's profound when we get it wrong. They need to be a part of the solution. We brought kids with us this time from CREATE and they presented at a session about participation. One of the young people there told us that he had limited or no knowledge of his country, of his family 
and he himself had been going out of his way trying to find out. It wasn't facilitated by his workers, but he himself, with connections, was trying to find out information. And you know what? That young person had been in care for 17 years. If the government takes Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island kids into care, it's unconscionable in this day and age when we've got so much history behind us, we know so much from the past that they don't put the provisions in place to make sure that they retain their sense of identity and connection to culture. Aboriginal children and young people should be involved in the development of a cultural support plan. It's not just a piece of paper. It's a meaningful interaction that fosters a sense of belonging and sense of identity. We know from this conference that there's fantastic work being done about cultural support plans and we were heartened to hear it, but the kids are telling us it's not happening on the ground. What I'm saying is we need to get back to basics. Let's stop ticking off those checklists and having massive, you know, reports to fill out and sitting in rooms with workers that are restrictive. Let's get back to basics and develop relationships with kids and let's have some respect to families in the process. Let's do it right and let's put kids at the centre of the solution. Thank you. We're now going to hear from Michael Tazard um, from Peak Care in Queensland and their experiences with the com <coughs> Combined Voices campaign and what lessons we might learn for a national campaign. Thanks, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you. I'm the, uh, the fifth speaker that was, uh, didn't know who he was in, um, was in and then was out, but was back in again. So <laughs> bear with me. I um, had to put my notes together this morning over breakfast. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land, the Gimoy Yidinji people, and by paying my respects to the elders, both past and present. Um, I am the president of Peak Care and I've been in that role for the past couple of years and um, on the board of Peak Care now for several years. My day job is director of out of home care for Uniting Care Community, um, a recent job that I started in early February this year, but a job that's brought many highlights about the, uh, the problems and the inequities in the system for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and young people. Um, Peak Care has been involved, I think, since 2009 in a campaign in Queensland called Combined Voices. And we've worked jointly on that campaign with the Queensland Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Child Protection Peak, the Queensland and Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Human Services um, Coalition, uh, Create Foundation and QCOS. And Combined Voices campaign is a campaign, there's a website, um, it's a campaign that draws attention to the over-representation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and young people in our child protection and out-of-home care system. And it calls on government um, and agencies to take action um, to address um, those problems. I think though, from hearing in particular the two Cindy's, Cindy Blackstock in particular and Cindy Kiro, um, over the last couple of days. What it highlights for me is while we've got a great campaign, we just don't have the strategies to actually lock government and to lock mainstream agencies in to, to delivering on strategies and targets to overcome this problem. Um, coming back into out of home care has really surprised me. It's horrified me in many respects. Um, we run programs here in far north Queensland, out of home care programs as a large mainstream organisation. What was horrifying was to find out that 50% of the children in our foster care program are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. When I asked the question about how many of our carers were Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, I was told maybe two, but they don't identify. So we've got very significant problems in Queensland in terms of over-representation, but also in terms of placement um, of children in non-Aboriginal placements. Um, I think what we really need um, for Combined Voices is a set of clear strategies, and probably nationally as well, that hold government and mainstream organisations accountable for taking action to address these sorts of problems. Um, I also, prior to coming to UCC, worked as a state manager for the Benevolent Society in Queensland. And um, I worked to implement three of four pilot integrated child and family centres across Queensland, funded by the state government. 
They're extremely well-funded initiatives. They are great program models and we worked in close partnership with Aboriginal community organisations to make sure that these mainstream services were culturally safe and appropriate for families with young children zero to eight. Um, the Child and Family Centres in Queensland are an integrated child and family centre model funded by the federal government. Um, and I suppose one of the things, also an excellent model in terms of addressing disadvantage and helping with early childhood education and care for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, children. But what's, what's surprising about it and what's a little bit shocking about it is the funding is way below um, what we're funded for the mainstream services. Um, and that funding, as far as I know, was for a four-year funding cycle and Aboriginal organisations applying for those services um, had to put in a sustainability plan about how they were going to self-fund the services beyond the four-year funding agreement. The state-funded services have got recur recurrent funding. Um, so I suppose, um, in summary, um, what I'd say is, um, well, we've got some excellent initiatives, we've got some fairly major problems, and I think any, any campaign like Combined Voices um, is no good just as a campaign in name. It's actually got to have strategies, it's got to have targets, it's got to lock government in, it's got to lock mainstream organisations in, and it's got to hold Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander organisations accountable for delivering services as well. So thank you. Thanks, Michael. Um, we heard their targets, strategies, and locking mainstream agencies into such a campaign. And I want to introduce Simon Schrappel, who I struggle with this name. Simon is a very difficult name for me to get my head around, my tongue around. Simon, please come up. Simon's going to talk to us about engaging non-Indigenous organisations in this campaign. Thanks, Simon. Thank you, Richard. It's a tough name, isn't it? Um, I'd like to start, too, by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet and to pay respects to elders both past and present. Um, a couple of thank yous to start with. Uh, firstly, to Michael, who did uh, stand in for me this morning. Um, I, I feel like I shouldn't be here. As soon as I arrived this morning, people said, oh gosh, we've got a replacement for you. We didn't think you were actually going to be here this morning. So, so I felt a little bit like reading your own obituary in the paper, really. And so, uh, <laughs> um, anyway, um, I have prepared something, but I do thank uh, I do thank Michael for also preparing something and for giving uh, that perspective both as a service provider and particularly from Queensland. Um, I also want to thank uh, Frank and Sharon and Snake for putting on a fabulous conference and for all of you to have turned up on the third day. Um, you should congratulate yourself. I know it's tough coming on the third morning of a conference uh, and you've done well. Um, I also feel I should actually start with a joke about football but uh, being a bloke but but Richard's already sort of taken my thunder. When I came in last night and I saw people in those maroon Guernseys sort of walking around the streets looking very depressed, I knew what the result had actually been. But um, I'm one of those ignorant uh, southern state people that don't quite understand the passion of, uh, of origin football, but I saw it in the eyes of all those Queensland supporters last night, so I, I do sympathise with you. Um, <laughs> All right. Um, I, I want to talk uh, just a little. Um, I, I wear a number of hats, but uh, this the, I'm talking today principally as the president of ACOS. Um, and um, I'm in a sense, I want to be talking to all of you, but I'm making a particular pitch to those non-Aboriginal organisations that are represented uh, here today and uh, are very much part of the constituency of, of ACOS. Um, ACOS has had a pretty proud and long history of advocacy, but it would be fair to say we probably haven't featured strongly in championing the rights and issues to do with uh, Indigenous Australians, um, and uh, it's time we stepped up. Um, I'm pleased to say that we have, in recent times, certainly done a lot more work and, and partnered with um, National Congress, and it's been great particularly to be able to work with Jody with our national conference and we had Lyndon more recently uh, berating the, uh, the Federal Treasurer in a Treasurer's Lunch we had a couple of weeks ago. I think the poor Federal Treasurer probably gets berating from a number of quarters, but anyway, we just added to his woes, I think. Um, and in more recent times, um, ACOS has been doing some quite significant work with peak bodies in the Northern Territory, with APONT, with Safety, um, with Congress. Uh, and with NT Cost to try and actually develop a, up a set of principles for mainstream non-Aboriginal organisations uh, in terms of the way they work and engage and partner 
with Aboriginal communities in the Northern Territory in a way that actually is truly aimed at trying to build the capacity of those organisations to, um, to take control and to be uh, the main players within the communities and they operate. Um, it's not easy to actually establish those principles, but I have to say it's been quite um, pleasing to see a number of international uh, and national organisations come together and we're um, trying to encourage them to sign up to a set of principles which are really aimed about um, facilitating self-determination in Aboriginal communities in the NT. What we're hoping that we might be able to take that out a bit further. But to this campaign, uh, which has some different origins, and I once again want to thank Snake, um, the Healing Foundation, ABSEC and Quatsip, if I can pronounce that correctly, um, for taking the leadership in this and for inviting both Families Australia, I also sit on the Families Australia board and ACOS to join those four bodies in taking some leadership with this campaign. Um, and in many senses, this is a campaign that's, that's near and dear to my heart and is one that ACOS is really pleased to be participating in. Um, earlier this week, I don't know if uh, many of you saw an article in The Australian, um, I'm going to quote The Australian twice, I'm not promoting The Australian newspaper, I don't uh, much agree with much of what's written in the, in the paper, but uh, nonetheless I, I tend to get drawn to it. Um, and in fact I only saw, got to see the headlines, it, was, um, it came across my screen earlier this week uh, for, as part of the ACOS clips that I get every day telling me about the sort of headlines and stories that are uh, around Australia. And I went to, to find the Australian in my local state in South Australia and this article didn't appear, but um, so I only actually got to read the headlines. And the headline was, Child Removal Rate Rise Slams. I don't know, for those of you in New South Wales that may have seen this, I think it was on Monday. I've got a feeling that both uh, ABSEC and Aqua's fingerprints were all over this um, we're all over this story. And it quoted Prue Gow, the, the, the Minister in New South Wales, who was blaming the child protection system uh, in New South Wales for the, uh, the rate of removal of Aboriginal children uh, into out-of-home care. And she said their systems were punitive and risk-averse. Um, and, and that resulted in this spiralling, spiralling rate of removal of Aboriginal children. Um, I think it's interesting that, that, that a state minister is actually looking at, their, at her own system and making those sorts of accusations. Now, if I read it correctly, she said that, that um, New South Wales had the highest rate of removal of Aboriginal children into out-of-home care and that 8% of Aboriginal children in New South Wales and out of home care, eight percent. It was an absolute staggering figure. Now I read that story um, and uh, I was drawn to it. But my question, I guess, is how does the general public read those sorts of stories if they read them at all? Um, and the essence, and why I ask that question, the essence of this campaign, in my sense, is it's not so much about us understanding this issue. I think we know it all too well. We know the problem and we know it's getting worse. Our job is about changing the hearts and minds of the broader Australian public to make this a number one issue for Australians. That's our job. And unfortunately, to date, for all of those sorts of stories, and there are more too that appear in the media from time to time, and I know many of us are there trying to promote this information and get it out there in the media, but we've failed. I think, unfortunately, we have failed to convince the rest of the nation that the issue of the over-representation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in the child protection system and out-of-home care is a national problem and a national shame. We've failed to make people aware that it's such a significant problem and we've failed to put solutions on the table. So that is the point of this campaign. It's our ambition. We need messages and we need language that works for the broader public. Um, I quote the four C's, which I think have to be the core of this campaign. We have to be clear, we have to be cogent, we have to be concise, and ultimately we need to be convincing. It's one of the reasons we engaged um, some specialists in market research, EMC, to actually work with um, the people that are leading this campaign to try and actually test, market test some of the messages out there in the public that we'll end up using in this campaign. Our target ultimately will be about getting governments to change the way they do business, the way they invest, particularly in early intervention and prevention, the way they support Aboriginal families to be able to care for children. But ultimately we'll only get that if we have the Australian population saying that this is a problem that must be addressed by governments. We must make sure that the Australian population is telling our governments all around Australia 
that this is the most significant issue. In the same way that the Australian Government finally got it in relation to disability with the National Disability Insurance Scheme, two to three years ago, nobody would have thought what we actually saw announced earlier this year, only a month or so ago in Parliament, with bipartisan support would actually happen. And happen with a whole new tax, the thing that you know, supposedly Australians hate the most, to actually come in behind it. So I think it gives us some heart to know that we can actually make those changes. But I want to finish by just talking about um, a couple of the other, what I think are, are prerequisites for this campaign to work. First and foremost, we need to act together. It's great that Snake and the others are actually leading this campaign, but we need, particularly in the first instance, all of the NGOs, all of those that operate in the child and family welfare space to come on board and support this campaign. This is a bit of a call to arms to all of us. We need all of us saying uh, and talking in a concerted and unified voice. We need all of us, every time we are advocates, every time we meet a politician, every time we make a submission, every time we write a letter, putting first and foremost the issue of the overrepresentation of Aboriginal children in out-of-home care as our number one talking point. We might have lots of other pet gripes about the way, you know, the problems in the system and the way we, res we uh, respond or get treated by government, but we all need to be making this our number one issue. And secondly, we need to be able to create a war chest to actually support this campaign. We're not going to change hearts and minds around Australia unless we get messages out there that are clear and concise and convincing. Most of, uh, uh, of the organisations that operate in the child and welfare space, uh, family welfare space, would have received a letter in the last week or so talking about this campaign. And if you haven't, I'm sure we'll have copies to give you, to take away with you today. It asks people to participate in this campaign to actually make sure the sorts of messages that are outlined in that correspondence are front and centre of your advocacy messages. It also asks people to come to a meeting that's been convened uh, later this month in Melbourne. But it's also asking people to make a financial contribution. And I know how tough that is. I run an organisation uh, and I know how tough it is to find um, funds for campaigns and for advocacy. But it's, it's a choice I think we all must make. There's been a lot of outsourcing of out-of-home care, a lot in New South Wales. I suspect following the inquiry in Queensland, it'll be the direction that's taken here too, and variously in other states it's occurred. And it's resulted in a lot of organisations, um, a lot of non-Aboriginal organisations, getting much larger as a result of that contracting of services, of out-of-home care services that are provided by the state. I think our objective as organisations in this sector is not to grow, but it's to stop the flow. We must be doing much more about stopping the flow and entry of Aboriginal children into out-of-home care rather than just trying to find solutions. Well, I know we need to find solutions for once children are removed, but we must be making a much more concerted effort to actually stop that flow. I just want to finish by saying I, I read The Australian again. That's two admissions I've made. Um, I think it was yesterday, as I, last, last night as I was coming over on the plane, um, and there was a story about closing the gap stats. Um, and uh, I don't know if other people have managed to actually pick up on this. And uh, I think the stats were um, somewhat mixed. There were some sort of positive things in, in a couple of areas like literacy and numeracy for uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and young people. But in other areas like homelessness, I think things were going um, backwards. Um, I think one of our campaign aims is to make sure that as part of closing the gap, this issue of the over-representation of Aboriginal children in out-of-home care and in child protection systems more generally is front and centre of a sort of co a future COAG agenda. So that's one of the reasons that uh, ACOS is supporting this campaign um, and we're hoping that we'll get all of you and your organisations on board soon. Thank you. Thanks very much, Simon. We're going to hear from Sharon Williams, Chair of SNAKE, who mm. are leading and coordinating this campaign. Sharon's mm. going to just give us an update and run us through how the campaign's going. Thanks, Sharon. Thank you, Richard. And thank you, my, my um, panel. It's absolutely fabulous. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge that we meet on the land of the, of the traditional owners of the land. No, I'll start that again. I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet here today. We'd acknowledge their ancestors, their elders past and present, and we 
uh, honour the expertise that's in this room today. And we acknowledge our panel. And this campaign is truly a, an incredible point in where we're going with the future of Aboriginal children and families. It's an opportunity for us to, to take a stand and recognise that we need to do something now because as we've heard over the last two days, the stats for our children and families is diabolical. It's at a point where we can't, we shouldn't, we will not stand for this to continue without us taking an action. We need to look at the overrepresentation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children. Now, I've got a PowerPoint as well here. If I can get it to work. There we are. So there, we're talking about the over-representation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and family in the statutory uh, child protection service across Australia. This information is well documented and we talk about it and we hear it and we see it and we need to take an action. We need to say this cannot continue. We've heard our keynote speakers over the last two days talking about how important it is for us to make a difference now, to not allow this to continue. Our children have rights. Our families need for us to stand up and say it's time. We talked about lots of data and lots of information, but I want to go through that one more time. When we're talking about our children, zero to 17, we make up 4.7% of Australia's population. However, we are 32.4%, uh, that's 13,268 of our children are subject to care and protection orders. That's 9.7 times more than non-Aboriginal children. We are 26.7% more likely to be subject to, to sus substantiated notices, 7.8 times more likely than non-Aboriginal chi non -Aboriginal children. And we are 33.6% of the out-of-home care population, 10.3 times more likely than non-Aboriginal children. They are incredible um, stats, things that cannot continue. The figure, figures in Queensland indicate that in 2012-13, 62% of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children aged 0 to 17 will have had some contact with the child protection system. 62%. Half of our children will have had contact with the child protection system. A change is needed and it's needed now. The current approaches for ensuring the safety of our children is not working. In response, we need to take an action. And in response to these issues, a group of in Aboriginal um, and non-Aboriginal organisations led by SNAKE have joined together to call for a fairer and more just response to the needs of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families and communities. The founding organisations, as Simon has said, to this campaign is SNAKE, the Secretariat of the National Aboriginal and Child Care Services, the Aboriginal Child and Family Community Care um, State Secretariat for New South Wales, Queensland Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Child, Peak, Child Protection Peak, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Healing Foundation, Families Australia, and the Australian Council for Social Services. So what's happened with our campaign so far? These org organisations formed a national campaign coordinating group in 2012. And in November of 2012, 22 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and non-Indigenous organisations from across Australia participated in a campaign workshop. Since then, the national coordinating group has been working to refine the campaign Identify what it is we can do, how can we do it, and how can we involve all of you, all of the people who in some way 
have a role to play in looking after Aboriginal children. It was essential, it was important for us to have the best information, the best campaign, the best process to make this happen. And therefore, um, Essential Media um, Communications, EMC, were, came on board to undertake the research on public understanding of atti and attitudes um, to properly inform and develop our campaign. One of the things that we needed to do very early in this process was to identify that we had a vision, that the campaign had a vision, and the vision is that all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and young people grow up, grow up safely at home, get a good education, are healthy, and are, prou and are proud of who they are. Aren't they basic rights for all children? Why do we need to have a vision that says we need to do this differently for our children? It's every child's right. Our objectives for the campaign we have, have been set out in chunkable stages, in things that we know that we can achieve. And stage one is to halve the number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children in out-of-home care by 2018. And we've already talked about the extremely high numbers that are there. And stage two of our campaign is to reduce by 2023 the number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children in out of home care so that it is proportionate to the representation of the general population. Wouldn't that be something, something to achieve? And then we would truly be closing the gap, Simon. And that's where I'm going to stop for this point because I'm, I'm hoping we will have some questions that we, would, we as a panel would like to answer. Thanks, Sharon. Um, look, you're all aware of those statistics. They're very sobering. We're going to open it up now for some um, questions, uh, discussion and comments. Um, We've got a couple of roving mics here so that we can, uh, ladies with the, oh, lady and a guy with a <laughs> blue shirt holding up the microphone. So we want to hear from you. We want to hear from the floor of the conference. So please attract their attention and let's hear from the, thank you. Hello, I forgot your name, Sharon, sorry. I knew it started with an S, but I didn't want to call you something wrong. You know, we've already had that, <laughs> so I'm um, welcome. Um, my question is, how are you going to halve the number of Aboriginal kids in care when they're rubber stamping the kids with 18 year wardships? Those kids are going to be in care until they're 18. I mean, that's what happens in New South Wales. You can ask the um, Aboriginal Legal Service sisters over there and they will tell you that kids come into care before, before there's, you know, there's this really quick court, court process and the kids are put in care until they're 18. So I, I guess I'm saying when those kids are going to be in care until they're 18 and um, how are you going to halve it? Unless you change the, um, the, the fact that, you know, there's going to be some um, restoration and preservation of these families. That's, to me, that's the only way you're going to halve it. Thank hey. you for that. And, you know, you can talk to the Aboriginal Legal Service in New South Wales because that's what happens more often than not. Hey, sisters, they're nodding their heads at me. I think the only way to, to change the process, we need to address the children, uh, the, the issue of our young people in, in care at the moment and see where we can have them back in, into kinship care or with family. But more importantly, we have to put the dollars at the front end. If we're not doing intervention and prevention, if we're not capacity building families, then we're continually having a, a flow of young people into the system. We have to do the preservation. We have to work with families. Thank you. And we, that, that's the campaign, to actually stop the flow. We can work with families to, to return children to community, family, to culture. But unless we stop the amount of the number of young people being brought into the system, then we're, we will continually have the increase in the number who are, who are in care, and we're, we're, our, our capacity to to recruit 
foster carers and, and provide um, appropriate homes for children is diminishing. So unless we do something now, we, we will, will be in, at a place. And um, uh, Cindy talked yesterday about we are at a place in our history where our young people are out, outnumbering the, the older, uh, older community. How are we going to manage that process when we um, are not caring for our children when we have the opportunity to? So. Pardon? Use the mic. My, my concern is that, you know, there's this really quick process in New South Wales where kids are removed, they they're, um, go to court, maybe the families have got an issue like rent, that they're behind in their rent, so they, they look for 18 year wardships for these kids, so they're, they're not going to be back with their mother and father for the next 18 years. I think we need to stop the punitive response to what's happening with our children. We need to actually involve them in their future. We need to listen to children when they're saying what their issues are and we need to act accordingly. We need, we need to, be, to be the adults supporting children and young people and making sure that they're the centre of all the decisions we make about them into the future. But I, I do believe our campaign is getting you and everybody here to stand up and make a stand and say we as the service providers need to make a difference. Government needs to fund differently. Good morning, panel, and, and uh, members of the conference. I'm Brian Butler from uh, National Congress, First Nations Peoples Congress. 62% um, of our children are in out-of-home care, right? That means 62% of our kids are not and haven't got love in their life, haven't and don't know what proper love is from the family. We sit here in our conferences time after time after time, whether it's a health conference, an education conference, snake conference, and people talk about we must work out how we're going to get what sort of strategies are we going to use and come up with to be able to make a change? The strategies are already there. We have a responsibility. We know who the uh, people in the corridors of power are. We know where they come from. We know how they get and could climb the ladder. You know, people go into local government uh, local government, they progress to state government, territory government, they progress then to national, to federal government. We know who all those people are. So it's therefore up to us, the individual, every one of us in this room here, to first strategy number one, write to those people. Don't bring them up, bring them up on the phone. Don't uh, text them or email them, you've got to write a letter to those people. That's how people get things business, that's how business is done. It's our business, I would say to the panel, for us to take the responsibility. It's our, to write to whoever is immediately in charge of our lives, lives and our children's lives, and tell them that it's wrong. I was a, I've been in, in a many pa uh, campaigns or, or uh, conferences where up to a thousand or more people are, have been and I've asked the question, how many, hands up, how many people have written to the government uh, in opposition to the Northern Territory intervention? How many? I rest my case. Look, I can only count about 20 people in this conference of over a thousand people. That's not good enough. In another conference, I asked <coughs> that same question. Eight people put them up, their hands up of a thousand people. And they were at that conference supposedly trying to bring about a change in this country for the betterment of Aboriginal uh, people and their children. So let's, get a, let's be real here. When we hear the panel talk about 
the campaigns that we need to fund and campaigns we need to do. We've got that, we've already got it there. That, you know, strategy number one is write those letters. Strategy number two, with a, as I said yesterday, we've got two months to go before the, uh, to the 14th of September before the, uh, the election. Get to work. Get to work on your politicians. Get them to come out and say, I'm going to stand up here. I'm going to do something for about, our, uh, uh, about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children out of home care. Get them to ask them the question. If you don't ask them the question, nobody else is going to ask them the question. If they don't get those questions asked of them, they will not then come up in the platform and say what they're going to do for us when they want our vote. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, just before we... Yeah, just find someone to ask the next one. Just before you ask, um, we do have people scribing here, so people are taking down your comments, your questions and the points that you are making. I... Um I've worked in the, uh, I work in the child protection system in South Australia. Um, I have been to a number of conferences and I, I have spoken about what happens within um, the child protection system. Every day, as an Aboriginal person, I am making those people who work in that system what it is like to be an Aboriginal person to be in that system and what we need to do. I look around and there are so many strong people in, in this room, Aboriginal people, who have spoken timelessly about what we need to do. I honestly believe people aren't listening to us. We have to face the Western system, a model that is very different to our culture. We talk about having connection with our family. We are prevented from doing that because of colonisation, about what happened to us in the past. It is quite sad that people aren't listening to us as Aboriginal people, what we know about our business. We can talk about it, we can make people aware of it, but people aren't listening to us. It happens all the time. And I'm, I'm afraid that those people in middle man management need to listen to the people that are here that have got something to say because it is quite astounding. I'm listening to people around, but I know what it's like for these children who are in care, who are, we are trying. First of all, we need to look at how many Aboriginal people are employed in these areas. I can tell you, not many, and they know their business. So I'm afraid people need to start listening to us who work on the ground who know exactly what's going on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lady Green. Morning everybody, I'm Winston Matthews from New South Wales. I work for uh, New South Wales Community Services. Uh, the next thing I'm going to say, a lot of people may not like it, but in the past 25 years, since 1988, we've had a lot of investment in whole community, whole family business. And with the cuts that, um, that were through ATSIC, in, uh, where they cut it at 10% in Canberra, it decimated communities up to 50% uh, and even greater. And the main program that was cut was the Child, Youth and Children's Agenda. And so we've, we're on the back foot. We've got a generation and a half of, of work to catch up on. The Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, $480 million again, you know, to be frank, pissed up the wall. Because there was only one recommendation and that's why we have reconciliation today. The other thing that uh, I do within the department is sit on an Aboriginal child placement panel. And that, is, that happens once a month. And so we coordinate kinship care for Aboriginal children that are coming through the process. To look at kinship care, we have geneograms that support that work. We are now looking back five generations that are decimated. And then now some of those geneograms are hooking up with other geneograms that are five generations decimated. So kinship care, whilst we want our, our children to be back in families, the reality is that at a clan and tribal level, we now need to be stepping up. And it's not just about the individual that is at risk. We are looking at entire families that are at risk 
And for some mobs, it's entire clans that have been decimated over the past 228 years. And the catch-up game will probably take another 500, I kid you not. So the biggest thing about New South Wales is that we have 92% of Aboriginal children in care and we have only 8% of carers that are Aboriginal. And I know this one fellow in Mount Druitt where he's doing the clan and tribal fostering. And he's got kids in and out, that family, you've got mob in and out. But they are successful. They do everything that's been spoken about at this conference with their children. And these are the leading examples of people in, at the grassroots level that are trying to do it. So it's about everybody. It's not about writing letters, uncle, I'm sorry. It's about how we need to step up as people and start caring for our, for our mob. If we are a people that belong to a culture that is based on relationship. I stand here proud as a grandmother of three beautiful children that will never have this experience. So now what do I do for others? But who's with me to do that for others as well? That's where it's at. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have another question up there? And then down here. Yeah, you've got to turn it on. Hello. Hello. Um, a question for the panel. Um, just to add to what Winston's saying, if, we, if we're looking at fifth, sixth and seventh generations of Aboriginal children being removed, do you think it would be good rather than to run a campaign targeted towards the kids because this, for generations things have been targeted towards the kids, what do we do about healing families because the children that are being taken are being taken away from children that's been taken away? You know, what, what can we do to stop that and how can we look to intervene? Thank you. Anyone from the panel? Sorry, you want to repeat that last part? Is you're talking about the... If, if Aboriginal children are being stolen... Yep. And we're, talking, we're not talking about just this generation and these generations, the kids that you're looking at targeting now. We're talking fifth, sixth and seventh generation, so it's not, it's not new. It, why would campaigns be focused towards the kids if we know from, the, from historical factors that the kids are the ones that's growing up and then living with trauma and look to self-medicate and... And then the next thing that happens is children come along and get stolen from them. What can we do or, or should, do you think that this campaign should be focused towards families and about getting, getting those people and help, help them healing so they don't have their own children removed because we've still got people running around needing to link up with services like Link Up so they can find their families and if we continue to focus on the children we need to be family focused, not just focus on any particular part of a family, I think anyway. The whole campaign is based on you know, reducing the number of kids that are coming to the attention of the department or coming into care. However, it's, it's just not that part. It's about taking a holistic approach in working in, with the whole family. And I, Sharon emphasised um, quite strongly about that early intervention and prevention. That's where we've got to begin. Look. I, um, when I got up there, I didn't sort of say where I am or who, who I come from or where I work or anything like that. I'm actually, um, I'm a Yorta Yorta woman from Marupna, Shepparton, Victoria, live in Townsville, work in one of the most beautiful islands in Australia, Palm Island. Now, one of, I could close my eyes in any of those places I live in and the history and the stories are identical right across Australia. And there is this whole historical oppression on Aboriginal families that has created this massive problem we've got now. What? Yeah, I'm, I'm saying that. That's why I don't want to preach the preach. However, one of the practices that we've all got to um, look at now is not forget that past, bring it with us, 
heal that process and the way forward is to prevent it ever happening again. This campaign is, it has to work. It's got to work and it's not going to work unless the whole community comes with us. And that's right across Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people of this country. So in terms of your question, I think the holistic approach is the way we're all going to go. And if it continues, we've got to continue fighting the fight. Never give up, never stop. But take a lead on preventing this from ever happening again in this country, because enough's enough. Okay, thanks, Rachel. Great question up the back. Lady in the middle here. Hello. Oh, lady in the middle over here. <laughs> Hi. Um, first of all, I want to um, acknowledge my brothers and sisters, the traditional owners of this land, and thank you for inviting me from here. I'm from part of the Ewan Nation down on the south coast of New South Wales, so thank you. Um, my question is, how can we move forward when we here as an adult are still letting the government treat us like we were here 200 years ago? We have to get past this. Even the closing the gap question makes us find somebody to say we're Aboriginal. Come on, why do we have to carry a form around to say that we're Aboriginal to get housing, health, on, on any list that goes. If we can't change the futures as adults and get the government to stop wanting that, and I do acknowledge the fact that sometimes we're our own worst enemies because we have Aboriginal services asking to identify as Aboriginal. You know, the dog tag went out years ago. My grandfather had to wear a dog tag. And yet we're still now, even if you go for Aboriginal housing, where's your form? You've got to get somebody to, to sign it off in that community. You may not come from that community. You've been already dispossessed from the property where you do come from. Even Nara is made up of a lot of people that, you know, had a boy's home down there and a children's home. The people were just transferred down there. So how do we close the gap when we still as adults have to prove that we're Aboriginal? Look, I'm a 63-year-old Aboriginal and I, I don't have a certificate. And I tell you, if I was asked to get one, I think that would be the day I'd take it to court. Because why should we, as Aboriginals, have to have a form to say we're Aboriginal to get health and housing, to get acknowledged in our community? That, you know, how can we move forward for our kids? I'm a, I'm a manager of our home care service. And I see these children coming in, and they are coming in because they've got no housing, they've got no support prior to getting them into the place. How can they, how can they look after their own kids if they can't even get decent housing? And the other day, as people were saying, they don't even have clean water. We're worse than a third world country in some of our, in some of our areas in New South Wales. We spend millions of dollars and give it to people overseas. They can't even put water in areas of, of Northern Territory and housing for people. So how do we get them, the parents of these children that are all really depressed and already disowned and feeling lost, to get them to look at their children and go, I need to change? When they've got to go down there and talk most times to a white person, that'll say, where's your form to say you're Aboriginal? How can we change that as adults? Because if we don't change that for ourselves. Our children are just coming along after us in this same cycle of things. We are Aboriginal people. Dog tags went out with our great grandparents and our great and our grandparents and that. We need to stand up for that now and that'll be a way that we'll be able to show our children. It's very hard when you have your child removed from you. We're not in that space because we you know we're self determination. But some of those mothers they feel like they've got nothing. They've got no grandparents showing them how to do it. They've, got, they've had no parents showing them how to show love. How do, they, how do they get it? How do they get it when they go out in that community? And I listen, I live in a racist town. You can count the people that work in the shops in Nara, the Aboriginal people, on one hand. One hand, and we have two large missions down there. One hand, you can count the Aboriginals that work in the town. Okay. So, we, you know, we need, to, we need to change it for ourselves first. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well stated. We'll take that as a comment. There's a question over the back here. There's one down the middle. Yeah, we'll go here. Uh, there's a microphone up the back. He's waving at me. <laughs> if anybody up there wants a mic. Okay. Lady in the middle. Um, my question's open to the panel. Um, 
I, I just want to know what the strategy is um, to change the hearts and minds of everyday Australians because everyday Australians look at these statistics and they say these are a good thing. They say that, you know, 62% of um, Aboriginal people in Queensland having contact with the system is a good thing because Aboriginal people can't look after their children. That's the dominant thinking. You know, Andrew Bolt will pick up that statistic and the messages that then gets around the community, um, you know, mainstream society, how are we going to stop that? Because, you know, our people have been standing up against these issues for a really long time, but nobody's listening. Nobody's listening because the larger society says that this is actually a good thing. Aboriginal people, you know, young people need to be taken out of care. So what's the strategy to actually change the hearts and minds of those people so that we can get the right voices out? Thank you. Hi. Um, yesterday, um, Frank and Lisa Hillen gave me a document that was from EMC, who are the people that are doing the market research for us. And I think at first glance, and Frank and Lisa can correct me if I'm incorrect, but um, it was very um, positive that the public actually have a lot more understanding and seem to be a lot more sympathetic to the issues, and that is, was quite um, different to what we may have thought. Do you know more about the report, Simon? Um, yeah, it's a great question because I think it's the heart of what we need to do, um, but just picking up on that bit of research, and it's why we've, we're investing with EMC to do this, this research, and it's interesting when you talk to parents um, about these sorts of issues, um, and they're only one cohort of the broader public I appreciate, um, you do get quite a different perspective. Um, you know, that stat that I referred to earlier, about 8%, I mean, this was what I read in the paper the other day that came out of the New South Wales government, that 8% of Aboriginal children in New South Wales end up in care, I mean, that's, it's close to one in 10. When that statistic is put to non-Aboriginal parents, they're astonished. They're not saying, oh, good on them. They're saying, I would fight tooth and nail. I would kill if somebody tried to take my child away. I don't think we've got a message out to the Australian population about how significant this issue is, how big an issue it is, and what impact it actually has on families, uh, Aboriginal people and Aboriginal culture. And when that message is getting out there, and the research is showing this, people are responding. And you're right, we'll have lots of shock jocks and Andrew Bolts of the world who will provide alternative messages. Unfortunately, we're not putting an alternative narrative out there. And, and a large part of this campaign is to get an alternative narrative. You know, it's, it's not going to be easy. Um, you know, I've been working as part of ACOS to try and do the campaign, the New Start campaign, to try and get governments to actually give a decent go to people on New Start in terms of the allowance. We didn't get anything in this budget. We'll, we'll keep that fight going. And it's about getting allies. We managed to get allies in the business sector and people that we never thought would come in behind this. You know, we have to actually find the, the touch points for them that will actually make it meaningful. So, I, I mean, you're spot on, um, but that's, I mean, the research is trying to, is telling us which groups in the community will actually support us. Um, and, and the final thing I just wanted to say briefly is that, I mean, it's fantastic to have this passion in this room. It's tremendous if we have a thousand people supporting this campaign. But when you look at what happened with the uh, NDIS and, and the campaign, Every Australian Counts, they moved from a thousand to something like 150,000 people writing letters and, and, and blogging and you know, sending messages. I think it even got in, it, much higher figures than that. And it's when we get that sort of mass commitment across the population that we'll actually see some change. But a great question. Thank you. Yeah. Good morning. Um, I'm Barbara Shaw and I'm from the Northern Territory, Alice Springs. I'd just like to say, I don't know, probably a statement or a question. Take it whichever way you want to take it. In this room, there are mothers, grandmothers, aunties, uncles, fathers, grandfathers. There are social services or non-Aboriginal and Aboriginal organisations that provide services to our children. We know what Howard did to our Aboriginal organisations the 11 years that he reigned this country. We all know what's going to happen in September when Abbott gets in. I come from a territory where I've got an Aboriginal Chief Minister from New South Wales who thinks forced adoption is good for our people. And now I've got also Aboriginal MLAs saying that every Aboriginal child should be with a non-Aboriginal family. When the police and the, when the federal police and the army came into the territory in 2007, I locked the gates on my camp. I locked my 
gates to my house or my yard. I kept my kids in my house for two weeks, thinking that the army was going to come into my camp and take my children away. Now we've got Aboriginal experts out there that say, oh, Aboriginal people don't need their culture. It's the Aboriginal culture that's the breakdown barrier of our lives today and our society. What I'd like to see... <coughs> I agree with Uncle Brian and I, and I agree with Auntie. There is power in the pen. Media, mainstream media here in Australia does not allow Aboriginal people to voice their concerns in our communities and our towns, our state and territories. We need to use the power of the pen. We need to take action and say, this is what we do for our kids in our communities. We're going to keep them in our homes. I've, in the last few weeks or a couple of months, I had an Aboriginal MLA say that Aboriginal children are the Amani handbags of the white woman today. Now, how can they say that an Aboriginal child of the Northern Territory is an item off the shelf? Now, that's pretty disgusting for Aboriginal people in high power to say that. Now, what I'd, I'd like to see in this, like there's Aboriginal people right across the country that have got, you know, we look at statistics here today and in the last few days and over the last seven you know, six years of the intervention and now we've got this thing about closing the gap. Closing the gap report is pretty disgusting when I live in the Northern Territory. There are more kids on our streets. There are more kids in the justice system. There are more kids getting into drug and alcohol. You know, I am a mother. My best interest is my daughters now. If no one's not going to support me in having the best interest for my child in my camp or any other children that comes through my home and lives out in the remote communities of the Northern Territory, then where is the best interest when you've got people in high places that say Aboriginal people should not be practising their culture, should not be practising their language and should not be living in their own communities? We all know what the Howard government did to us. The Abbott government is going to make it worse. Yep. So okay. what are we going to do from now and then September? You know, we're here for our children. We're here for the next generation. My grandchildren, my great-grandchildren. You know, you're all here at the same time. Your children, my children. My children, your children. That's how it's got to be. We're family-orientated people and we look after... Our, if we're not looking after our own, we're looking after somebody else's child. Abbott's not going to come to my camp and look after my child. Julia Gillard's not going to come to my camp and look after my child. You know? Thanks, Bob. Thank you. <laughs> Everything I've heard over the last couple of days is about that our culture, our history, our identity is central, um, you know, to the, the health and well-being of our children, and we need to keep promoting that. We might take one or two more questions. Yeah, we're not we finished yet. If you just step back a little bit, we're way up here. Yep. My name's Wayne Griffiths. I'm from a little town called Gunnada. I'm in New South Wales. I don't know if you can hear me or not, but certainly I've got a big enough mouth. And listen, you give me your address, because I'll go and stand in that gate with you and stop them from coming in. But... <laughs> now, um, I'm a proud kinship carer in my community. I have uh, my two nephews and a niece and I have a grandson that I have in kinship care with me and um, I love them every day of the week so they're not unloved and uh, my wife she's a fantastic woman she's she's the the apple of our family she's the hub of our family and at some point government's going to stop researching Aboriginal people because we're the most researched people in this country And there's the best people for our kids are us ourselves. We know, we know what we want to deliver to our children. I've, I've got uh, a daughter, I've got two sons that are older, and I've got another daughter. And um, people might think I must, I must be 100 years old, but that, uh, I've got one daughter, she's 33, my other son's 34, my other son's 24, and my daughter's 14 years of age. And we love them exactly the same as we love our other kitties in our family. And I've got five other grandkids. 
Every day of the week my house is full, full of black kids, full of white kids that come around and visit them because they've got a lot of friends. But the bottom line is this, I work for a little Winnenarly Aboriginal Child Family Centre and every day of the week we have a phone call from community services and every day of the week we say come out and have a look and finally it's just beginning to work with them. I know they're nutcases sometimes. But only this week I got a call from work and one of those workers are coming out and they've referred a family to us. Three weeks ago they referred another one to us. Three weeks prior to that they referred another one to us. And you know, we're working with those families on the ground and how we change that, um, a couple of those um, nutcase workers came out and said, what can you do about this? Well, I took them up to the street. I said, here, what are you going to do about this? How are you going to help us help this family? And um, there's minor change happening in those areas, but not quick enough. And you know, we all know Julia Gillard's going to be sitting up on the back bench in a, in a couple of months' time. But we've got to change it ourselves too. At some point, we're going to stand up for our kiddies. When you see the smile on the face of a kid, you can't turn away from that. There's, no, there's not an Aboriginal kid in this country that I wouldn't love and, and take into my home at any given time. So I, it's not a question, it's just a statement just about a you know, what you. I'm doing uh, as an individual. And as I say, I love those kids every day of the week, 24 Thank you. hours. Thank you. Hello. We've got time for two more questions. Hello. We've got yeah. one here. Thank, uh, thank you. Yeah, um, my name's Paddy. I campaigned with Barbara against the Northern Territory intervention. Just to take stock of where we are politically, right, the protection board is back in the Territory. You've got the mission managers, you've got the ration system with the basic card. Police can go into the house any time they want without a warrant. It's back. But it's back around the country. You know, all, all of you mob are experiencing it with the child protection, with the cops, with the juvenile justice. The, me the mechanisms of control now are just as intense as they ever were back then, right? How did they get rid of the protection board last time? You know, your mob threw it off, threw it off. You know, the 10 embassy put those demands, shoved those demands in the face of the Australian population. You know, I, I believe we must throw it off again. You know, I think it's absolutely wonderful that there's a national campaign being considered, but the government won't do anything unless they're forced to do something. So I think that the forum that's happening in Melbourne is wonderful. We need public forums right across the country to expose this injustice. And those forums should call marches. People should march, you know, actually march about this, you know. And we need to actually push this issue. And I'll finish on the stories that I have heard since I've started having a look. I'm a white fella, right? Since I've started having a look at what's happening in child protection, <laughs> absolutely, you probably tell, absolutely shocking, right? People need to know. I, I disagree with something that would have been said. When I tell my mum about the stories I've heard about cops coming to the door with child protection workers and raiding houses and dragging kids out of houses across Australia, she's in tears. People must hear that. Your stories must be heard, but you've got to put it on the street and force it in their face. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> One more question here. I, I didn't think I'd get in, but thanks for that. Um, yeah, it's like, yeah, go the blues. Um, <laughs> And I'm from Queensland, so nah. <laughs> I just I just got a question for the panel about the partners because I think um, a lot of the Aboriginal people in here either did work for community services that got closed down and now working for big NGOs that are servicing our communities. So I think the people that are on, like your partners, I think in in the campaign, and it's probably a question for ACOS because I know the work that you're doing uh, in the in the territory with APON, talking about community services and the big NGOs. Um, I think. You might have a lot of sceptics because a lot of people will see um, your partners on the campaign as being the people who took the money from community organisations. Um, so I guess my question is, is, is what's the, I get, you know, like our kids have transition plans when they leave um, care. What are the transition plans that these big NGOs are making in order to put that control back to community and put the community service back yeah, on board? Yeah, because yeah, yeah. Because I guess, I mean, I, I come from a small community called Mornington Island and, and the fact being is that, you know, seven Aboriginal organisations closed over um, about five years and three big, big um, NGOs came in and, and we're talking, you know, millions of dollars of infrastructure and that support for community organisations weren't there when they needed it. We had um, the Singos go in, the, the, the worked on strengthening Indigenous non-government organisations, um, but, they, but they still closed. And now we've got these big services there. So what's the transition plan to return the money back to community? Okay. 
Thank you. We'll have to call it to a close there. I know this is a very important, very passionate issue. We've got um, Sharon's just going to come up and, and wind up for us. She's got... Uh, okay. Oh, yes. I'll, I'll do a very quick... Uh, look, spot on. Uh, and, and that is um, behind the campaign that I referenced earlier that, that you're aware about up in the NT and it needs to go more broadly. The responsibility sits with those main NGOs to actually take a developmental approach. Uh, we're not arguing there can't be a, a constructive role for uh, mainstream NGOs, but it must be about building capacity and getting out. I mean, I think there's some great examples in New South Wales that were brokered between... Um, uh, well, ABSEC and, um, uh, and ACWA, the, representing the, the respective agencies in that state, with out-of-home care to make sure that, in fact, there is effectively, I think, five-year windows and you can have those partnerships, but NGOs, mainstream NGOs, can't be there for the long haul. Otherwise, all we're doing is recolonising those Aboriginal communities. And it's wrong. And we're actually asking organisations to stand up, sign up to a set of principles to say that's not the way they'll operate in those organisations. From, a from ACOS's point of view, we can't compel our members to do that, but we're actually saying that's the responsible approach and that's what we're asking you to do. A great question, thanks. And, and look, I'll, I'll just sort of add my um, two bobs worth on this one because it is um, one of the biggest bone of contention for myself. The, what I refer to as bingos, big international non-government organisations are coming in on the um, understanding they're the experts in working in Indigenous communities. They're coming to save us again. And I could look around and look at some of my sisters sitting in front of here. They were around when we were kids trying to save us. And they still haven't got it right. So I think it's time they do back off in value the Indigenous or Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander content and we know how to do business better than any one of them. Thank you for your great, great questions. A wonderful session and will help us incredibly on where we're going next. So in terms of the campaign, what are the solutions? We believe the solutions include promoting an understanding of and the respect for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander rights and to culture. We believe that place Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, families and communities' decision-making at the centre of ensuring the safety and well-being of our children. And we believe that increasing the proportion of, of government expenditure on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander development and, delivery, and delivered preservation and early intervention services and targeted family services is an absolute must. And we believe that we need to increase the number and the capacity of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander child protection services available to provide preservation and early intervention services and targeted family supports and out-of-home care services is absolutely vital. Aboriginal people providing services for Aboriginal families and, and children. So what can you do? You, the people here, who can make the biggest difference. You can engage in the campaign and the discussion. You can sign up to the campaign. We will soon have a website and a logo, and this will happen in early July. You can organise to lobby your own states and federal members. And Uncle Brian, you're right, the pen is, is extremely powerful. And, and we call on everyone to lobby at every level to make a difference. And you can work with your, your local child protection peak bodies and your Aboriginal services to help them and to work with them to make a difference in your own state and to develop campaigns within your state. And what do we want from you today? From the, from the participants in the SNAKE conference, we need your support for the objectives of the national campaign and we want to act to achieve the campaign's targets to halve the number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children in out-of-home care by 2018. We want you to stand. Stand with SNAKE, stand with the founding organisations to make a difference. So if you agree, if you want to be part of this campaign, I ask you now to stand up.